we're about to get started. Um, and uh, so uh, we're going to do a couple of details as we talk. Uh, first of all, my name is Ellie Gettinger. I'm the Education Director at Jewish Museum Milwaukee. I would encourage you uh, to, it is, first of all, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual book club here, where we're talking about uh, Julius Rosenwald repairing the world with Hasia Diner. Now I'm going to, and I'm not sure why uh, Jim Rosenbaum is pinned on my screen, but we're gonna do a little technical details here as we go through. Um, first, as we all know, we're in a new virtual universe, so, if they're glitches, they're glitches, but we have uh, tried to figure most of them out and we hope that we will come up with a great product. But what we would ask for you is some patience and consideration uh, in the way that I normally would say at a museum event, hey, this is a great moment to turn off or silence your cell phone. This is a great moment if you haven't already muted yourself to mute yourself on, um, on the uh, Zoom call. Um, also, Things that you should know is that we're going to be doing a Q&A. We're going to be doing the Q&A in our chat. So put up your questions there. You can put them up during as they come to you. Uh, we'll get to them. We'll also be grabbing some of that Q&A from Facebook because this uh, conversation is going out through there too. So if you're on Facebook right now and you're watching, feel free to throw your questions up in the chat function and we'll, we'll toggle them over into the universe of Zoom. Everything can be everywhere. Um, for the best possible viewing experience, I would encourage you to go up to the little Zoom tab at the top if you're on a computer that says gallery view and change it to speaker view. So if you see that it says gallery view, you're actually in the right view. If you see that it says speaker view, you're in the one that looks like the Brady Bunch. Generally, it's a little bit better if you can just see the speaker uh, in the middle in a big way. As I said, put your questions in throughout. Um, and um, the other thing that I need to say kind of in the spirit of housekeeping is many of you have already made a donation in support of this program and all of the virtual programming that Museum Jewish Museum Milwaukee is doing. Um, since we've closed our doors, we've really tried to enrich our community in a number of different ways. So if you want to go and support that mission and you haven't had a chance to yet, feel free to head over to jewishmuseummilwaukee.org and you can make whatever contribution you're interested in making. We're happy to take any denomination. We're very open and welcoming that way. So let's get into the actual business of why we're here. As we were thinking about virtual programs, one of the big things that we were really thinking about is what are the sorts of programs that we can't offer when we're in the museum? What are the things that are challenging either because of ge geography, because of travel, because of uh, time and all of those pieces? And as we were brainstorming, we went back to an exhibit we had a couple of years ago, Allied in the Fight. And this exhibit explored Jewish and Black interactions in the civil rights movement. And it looked at partnership from the early 1900s up until today. So one of the pieces in this exhibit that had kind of, I would say, like a two sentence, maybe even less, maybe it was even one sentence, was about Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald School. And we didn't at that time have the opportunity to bring out the designer in to talk about this. And she had been working on it, I think, released this book in the moment that Allied in the Fight came out. And when we started thinking about programs we've always wanted to have, this is one of those programs. Um, Dr. Hasia Diner has been a tremendous friend to this museum for many years, and she is an eminent historian, and we are really privileged to have her with us today. We are so excited that she's here to share um, her research on Julius Rosenwald. And I have to say, even in kind of my, my thumbnail looking through and, and getting ready for this, this that I am so inspired by this character and I want him to have the kind of, uh, you know, cachet as a uh, philanthropist in the way that when you hear Carnegie, you have this whole picture of big foundations. I want Rosenwald to have that. And I'm excited to learn more with her today. 
Dr. Diner is a Milwaukee native, and she is the Paul and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History and the director of the Goldstein Gorin Center for American Jewish History at New York University. She is a two-time winner of the National Jewish Book Award. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diner. Okay, great. So I assume that I'm not muted and you can hear me. Um, obviously, okay, great. I saw um, Ellie shaking her hand, so the technical details um, are, uh, are now not to worry about. And so in the beautiful introduction you made, um, I am glad you included the fact that I am a Milwaukee native, Washington High School, Sherman Elementary School, Steuben Junior High, uh, Washington High School, um, the United Hebrew School. So uh, my roots really are in Milwaukee and uh, my uh, heart is here in, in, in some really profound ways. So um, let, me, let me begin and I gather I'm gonna be speaking for about 30 minutes. I tend to talk really fast. So uh, I wanna get a lot in and then there'll be um, Q and A and um, I look forward to your questions. So I, I do want to begin with uh, uh, just a little bit of background in terms of um, my involvement with this project. And um, so the, uh, the book, which um, I think that maybe you've had a chance to, um, to look at or to know about, um, is a volume in Yale University Press's Jewish Lives series. And I was approached by the uh, editor of the uh, series uh, to do this book, and he actually, you know, specifically asked me to do Julius Rosenwald. And so one of the questions I really had is, what is a Jewish life? And is it, uh, obviously these are all notable people, very famous people, but is it uh, the story of somebody who happened to be Jewish but did great things, important things, notable things in the world of politics, letters, arts, uh, uh, scholarship, whatever, or um, is a Jewish life, a life, of, uh, a, a narrative about how an individual melded their public work with um, that, what they, that which they defined as um, the essence of their being Jewish. And I really puzzled over that for a while and um, decided that in fact, Jew Julius Rosenwald was a wonderful example of that. He himself was not a particularly uh, religious person. He uh, um, uh, was not somebody who uh, uh, was uh, defined as specifically functioning within the Jewish world, although he surely did. Um, but yet in the work he did, um, his philanthropic work um, involving uh, um, African-Americans, he always put front and center um, the fact of his Jewishness and that as uh, somebody who um, had been, who had both benefited from uh, the uh, um, opportunities that America gave him as a Jew and gave his family, and also what he considered to be the uh, prophetic tradition of Judaism and um, the legacy of um, anti-Semitism, and it was something that was rife in the world around him, um, that um, his actions vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, his African-American philanthropy, and by the way, his other philanthropy as well, reflected something about him as a Jew. So very quick thumbnail sketch of his biography. He was born in 1862 uh, in um, Springfield, Illinois. His father had come to America as a peddler um, from um, the German-speaking lands. His mother, um, her, his um, maternal um, uncles also had come as peddlers and were reasonable, quite successful. They were based in Baltimore. And when Samuel Rosenwald came to uh, the United States, he uh, got his goods and his credit from the, um, uh, this family, the Hammerslaw family. And over time, he, um, he didn't do particularly well, but he did do well enough to, um, meet and marry the um, sister of the Hammerslaws. And um, after a set of um, uh, kind of unsuccessful businesses in a variety of places, uh, they settled down in Springfield, Illinois. 
and Samuel Rosenwald, um, very active in his synagogue, as was his wife Augusta in the women's uh, auxiliary, um, did reasonably well. Again, no, he was not at all um, particularly, he was not, we would not say he was uh, very affluent, but he, he became a respectable um, seller of men's, um, as they called it at the time, gents furnishing. And um, uh, Julius Rosenwald was um, grew up in a world in which all the Jews were involved in retail. Every all the Jews in the town owned some kind of commercial venture that sold men's clothing, women's clothing, dry goods. And um, he, Julius, uh, kind of had again a reasonably, a somewhat undistinguished um, uh, career um, up to the point where by accident um, his uh, brother-in-law uh, bought uh, shares in Sears Roebuck and um, was uh, he asked Julius will you go in with me on this Julius actually didn't even have the money um, that uh, Sears asked needed in order to rescue the company so Julius actually borrowed the money uh, from another cut from a cousin and um, he got in on um, Sears, and again, through a series of happenst uh, happenstances, um, he became president of the company, and um, his was one of the first um, uh, retail companies to uh, become uh, an IPO. And throughout his life, Julius Rosenwald said, you know, I didn't become wealthy because I was smart. I didn't become wealthy because I knew very much, but I was really just very lucky he had the right contacts. He had uh, uh, he knew people who could help him out when um, Sears needed uh, uh, infusions of cash, and um, he uh, the brother-in-law was sort of pushed out, and uh, Julius becomes uh, the head of um, uh, Sears Roebuck. Um, as he entered into a, a respectable, pretty solid business world, uh, living in Chicago on the South Side, uh, he began to dabble in philanthropy. And he, and he said, um, just at the moment that he started becoming, again, very involved in the philanthropic world, he said, my goal in life is to earn $15,000 a year. That's what he wanted. And he said, a third of it, my family will live on, a third of it I'm gonna reinvest in the business, and a third of it I'm gonna to put towards uh, those projects uh, that will make the world a better place. Now, he obviously did much better than making $15,000 a year, and one estimate I saw of like the 100 richest uh, people in American history, I'm not sure how accurate the list was, but we'll assume it was fairly good. He actually was the 59th wealthiest person in all of American history. And it was a list that uh, included, it was put together in 2009. So it, it has Bill Gates on it, uh, John D. Rockefeller. Um, so it's a pretty august uh, group. Now, um, before I um, go on any further, um, and I realize the time is moving quickly, there, if, when you, if you have a chance to read the book, you'll see I really liked him. You know, it's kind of hard to be a biographer and not like the person, but I will say there were several things I did not agree with him. He opposed labor unions. Okay, that to me is unacceptable. Um, he happened to be pretty uh, negative about women's suffrage. He said women have too much power already, um, although his wife was an activist and was a arrested at a demonstration at the White House in favor of suffrage. So um, that uh, takes him off the hook, I guess. Uh, but finally, and this will be the segue into his involvement with African Americans, when in the uh, 19 teens and into the 1920s, and just to say he died in 1932, um, in that period, when he was deciding what, um, uh, when, he, when he had already decided that the plight of um, the Negro in America was uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, concerns and uh, missions that he could speak to, he had in a way two options. One, and the one he didn't take, was to invest in what we understand to be the press for equal rights. He was a very tepid supporter of the NEACP. He 
was a supporter. He gave them money. He, he helped a bit. Okay. Um, but he was not active in um, sustaining the organization. That was a route he did not go, but he uh, took the position that the most important uh, way he could help was to provide uh, the resources for um, uh, African Americans to achieve an education. And he said the civil rights, the quest for equality would only follow if um, the uh, population, and that, and we're talking about, by the way, a population that's less than a half century out of slavery. Uh, so nearly all African Americans had a parent, and for sure a grandparent that had been a slave. And so the most important thing is education and the achievement of literacy. And at one point he even says, the man who cannot read is gonna put his ex on a contract that is going to undermine his ability to become independent, okay? And what he needs is to be able to read that contract and to see where he is being uh, essentially uh, uh, put in a situation that he can never um, make anything of himself. So he put his resources into education. He got a certain amount of flack from um, the um, civil rights establishment because the most of the projects he supported uh, were based on the reality um, and based on the fact that segregation was the norm. Okay, so the project that most people assign, associate with him, which is his school project, and um, from uh, the 19 teens until his uh, death in uh, 1932, he uh, um, financed, um, it's estimated to be about 6,000 schools throughout the uh, former states of the Confederacy. Um, he, one estimate said that 90% uh, of all school children in African-American school children in Mississippi went to a Rosenwald school. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And um, a study conducted by the U.S. Army uh, um, in, uh, at, at the outs um, onset of World War II uh, had data which showed the dis difference between World War I and World War II in terms of um, African-American literacy rates. And the U.S. Army study attributed the vast change to the Rosenwald schools. So um, it was a not insignificant uh, contribution to say the least. Now, he also funded many other uh, projects within the African-American community YMCAs, high schools, colleges, um, universities, medical schools, hospitals. Um, he established uh, the Rosenwald Fellowship for, uh, was, it would be the equivalent of today's um, MacArthur Genius Award. And these were for notable um, uh, African Americans in, the sci in science, the arts, politics, literature, um, the academy. Um, and to give them the opportunity to uh, enhance their their um, uh, their work, and so we could. I'll just get, uh, name one figure who uh, you're probably all familiar with, who had a um, uh, Rosenwald Fellowship, and this was Marian Anderson, who we all know that amazing image of her singing um, at uh, the Lincoln uh, Memorial in the face of the. Um, DAR having not allowed her to sing in Constitution Hall. And it, she, her, the boost in her career was when she won a Rosenwald Fellowship and went to Germany to study music, okay? And so, and again, now multiply this by hundreds and hundreds of uh, individuals uh, like Marian Anderson who really got their start um, through his um, financial um, uh, engagement. Um, but, Again, it was within the context of a world in which segregation was the norm. Um, and some black intellectuals at the time and political activists said, in fact, why is he financing a Negro uh, medical school? It was Meharry Medical School in um, uh, Nashville associated with Fisk University. Why is he financing a Negro medical school? He's not financing a Jewish medical school. Okay, and why is he uh, financing um, segregated education? 
Jewish children don't go to segregated schools. And um, he tended to be pretty uh, skimpy on words. We don't know a lot about what he was thinking. Um, but, you know, he wrote uh, in response to that, um, that the, that level of discrimination just does not exist. And uh, for the Negro to become a doctor, it is only within the context of a uh, Negro medical school. I, Julius Rosenwald, can't change every uh, medical school in the country and allow them and force them to admit uh, Negro students. But I can build a medical school, Ben Fisk, Howard, and so on, where um, uh, Negro uh, uh, applicants can get accepted, get trained, and uh, uh, provide health to their communities. Now, um, I uh, want to just say a little bit about his, um, the kind of giving he did, whether for um, African-American causes or Jewish causes. And again, we could have a whole program just on him as a philanthropist within the Jewish community. And I'll just give one example before talking about his philosophy of um, philanthropy, but the joint, the joint, the American Joint, um, Jewish, American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee essentially was started when he got up at a, uh, an event, at a meeting in Philadelphia, and he said, we have to do something for the Jewish war sufferers in Palestine and Central Europe at the outset of World War I. I will give, and then he uh, set an amount, and said, so long as others of you will give an equal amount. So in a sense, the joint uh, emanated from, its finances emanated from Julius Rosenwald. And, Again, we can uh, replicate this with other examples, but there's a hint about his philosophy of giving. He said, I don't want to be the only giver. Okay, but because by being the only giver, um, I will ex uh, dissuade others from giving to the same cause. So he essentially pioneers the match. I will give whatever the amount if others will give the same amount. He also never gave to endowments. He said every generation has to fund the causes and the institutions and the projects that it deems important. If I, Julius Rosenwald, am successful with Negro education, maybe we won't need uh, to finance it sometime in the future. So no endowments and the Julius Rosenwald Fund, which he um, organized in 1927, was uh, um, structured to go out of existence uh, 25 years after his death. So he died in 1932. So 25 years later, the fund had spent out all of its money. And again, the uh, endowments are yokes to the future imposed by the present. So other people have to give no endowments. And he said, I want the individuals who are the beneficiaries to not see themselves as takers, but also as equal participants. So um, in terms of the Rosenwald schools, he said, I will give them, I will build a school for um, uh, uh, colored children uh, in any community in the, uh, uh, again, states of the former Confederacy. If, for one thing, he demanded that the state Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Arkansas, that it give money also. And that it recognized the school as like these schools as um, uh, equal, uh, as integral parts of the state education system and that the principals go to the principals conferences and that they have to abide by the same uh, rules in terms of minimum uh, hours and quality of uh, instruction and so on. So he wanted the states to be uh, involved and to accept the schools. But I think the really important story here, or an, an, an important part of the story, is that um, he insisted that the local African-American community, Greenville, South Carolina, Fayetteville, uh, Arkansas, that, that uh, the local African-Americans also contribute to the school. Okay, it doesn't have to be money, but for example, if one of the uh, local townspeople owns a, a brick kiln, we should get, they should contribute, contribute bricks. Or a sawmill, they should contribute the, uh, the lumber. Or uh, they should house the teacher. 
pay, whatever, but they, it is their school, it's not my school. And they have to be shareholders in this school. Okay, and it's true again of so many of the other projects. And then in addition, he never wanted his name on anything. And that we know these to be the Rosenwald schools is ironic because he did not want them to be called that. He wanted it to be the Greenville School, the Fayetteville School, the Decatur School, but uh, a kind of um, tradition developed where people uh, call them Rosenwald schools and it's stuck. And his correspondence is fascinating in that uh, institutions, African-American, Jewish, other would write to him and say, uh, uh, would you be able to contribute money to this or that project? And we'll put your name up on the wall. We'll call this Rosenwald Hall. And he said, I'm sorry, I cannot give money to, your, uh, to this because he did not want uh, any money. And I know when Ellie began, she mentioned uh, Carnegie who obviously plastered his name on everything. And so one reason, and the last chapter of the book is called Forgetting Julius Rosenwald. And one reason he really was forgotten is that his foundation went out of existence and that his children continue to be philanthropists in, in a variety of ways and socially active, but the fun came to an end. There is only one place in the United States where you can see his name on a building. And this happens to be one building at the University of Chicago. And it was kind of a scandal uh, or a controversy because the Rosenwald family went on a very long vacation. I mean, this is what it means to have a lot of money. So they could go on a six month trip around the world. And when he came back, the president of the University of Chicago had put the name Rosenwald, had it, had it etched you know, into the, uh, the marble. And uh, Rosenwald, um, Julius, uh, known as JR, um, said he just could not embarrass uh, the president with whom he was so close um, and ask him to take the name off. So that is the only place where in Rosenwald's lifetime, uh, the uh, name uh, had to, his name appeared on, uh, on a building. Um, so um, that too was very much part of his philosophy. He's, so he said, if I put my name on this project or that project, then who else is going to give? Okay, and we know uh, that many um, uh, institutions actually suffer from that when people say, well, so-and-so is giving, why do I have to give? I'll give to something else. So he, um, if the modesty was false or not, I cannot tell you. It didn't really uh, creep out. I, my sense of the modesty was actually quite sincere, but he actually saw that as a, as a philanthropic strategy. You don't put your name on the cause because then the cause will not inspire um, others um, to uh, give. Um, so um, again, I, I, unfortunately the time is uh, coming to a bit of a, a close here and I'm gonna look forward to the questions, but I'll say that when he spoke about why he did what he did, and for the most part, he didn't speak about it. He just gave, okay? He, he gave or he didn't give. Um, and, and he really put a lot of thought into um, the, the many, many letters that came to him requesting money. Um, he, um, when he did speak about it, he said, as a Jew, it is my obligation to give. And it's my obligation to give because the world in which we live, that is not just the United States, but uh, uh, Europe at the time, is a world in which um, Jews are criticized for being selfish, cheap, uh, for not thinking about others. And um, through my philanthropy, I want to show that I, uh, that, um, that that is not an accurate uh, portrayal or image of, um, the, uh, of the Jews. So that is by my giving, I enhance the image of all Jews in this country and um, uh, in, in the world as, as, as he knew it. Um, and, um, and in particular, when asked why he gave to, to the cause of um, African-Americans, and obviously that was not a word that was used at the time, but the Negro, the colored people. He says, as a, as the, as a member of a group who suffered, I have a keen sense of um, empathy 
uh, for those um, who uh, find themselves in such dire straits. And um, I have been lucky enough to earn enough money. Remember, he wanted to be able to give away $5,000 a year. Obviously, it was in the many, many, many millions. But I have the means to do something with it. And it is my obligation as a Jew. And um, so um, not that he wasn't criticized for how he gave or um, what he gave to. And again, many Jews had some very critical things to say about what he did and some African-Americans um, as well. But he did it out of a, a, a real um, strategic, but yet heartfelt sense that this was um, his way of making America a better place. And so I'm going to um, kind of uh, bring this to a bit of a close. I see Cassie is already texting for, you know, for you to submit your questions. But I thought one of the most amazing um, ways to just kind of encapsulate this um, uh, came from an obituary written for Rose, Rosenwald by W.E.B. Du Bois, somebody who uh, one would think stood poles apart from Rosenwald. I mean, Du Bois, although he did get a Rosenwald scholarship and although he, in fact, he actually dedicated one of his books to uh, Rosenwald, but um, he was a fierce fighter for equal rights. Okay? He was the editor of The Crisis, the magazine of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People. He said he was an advocate for the, the fight for, um, uh, for equality and civil rights, but he, in his obituary for Rosenwald, which appeared in The Crisis in a black bordered page, said, no person has indicted white Christian America more powerfully than Julius Rosenwald. By his actions, he gives lie to the uh, uh, hypocrisy of uh, white, Ameri white Christian America. And so uh, his uh, Du Bois's obituary, I think, tells us a great deal of uh, uh, not only how um, African Americans, some most African Americans perceived him, uh, uh, the criticisms uh, to the side, uh, but also uh, we could say that Julius Rosenwald would have really loved that uh, that statement about himself, that he was able to defend the Jew by his work for African Americans. So um, I could talk longer about this, but I think there are questions. And I'm really happy to receive them. And I presume it's going to be moderated by uh, uh, Ellie. Uh, and um, I will defer to you as to how to do this. Well, I am going to take the role of facilitator. And I'm going to kick things off with my own question. Right. That in the past couple of weeks, we have had some very interesting uh, commentary, about, specifically in the arena of sports around um, Black Jewish relations and specifically around kind of anti, you know, with anti-Semitic rhetoric. And I think that this is one of the real challenges in looking at any cause, but the question of intersectionality and how all of these different places relate together. In his own time, it sounds like he was in this place where the Jewish community was like, well, you need to do more here. And the Black community didn't always respect the way in which or didn't appreciate the way in which he was doing this work or some part of it. So the question is, is there something to learn from Rosenwald in thinking about this present moment of how Blacks and Jews are coming together? Right, so that is a great question. And um, I think that, um, you know, the present moment is so fraught and so uh, volatile and it's almost, uh, um, uh, impossible to really know what, what's the right thing to do and what's the best thing to do. And as a historian, I always kind of shy away from the present. But I'd say the, the takeaway is that individuals um, have um, an obligation to do what they can. The way they do it may not be the way that others do it. Um, but um, it is, um, I'd say, our, uh, as, as human beings, responsibility to learn, which he surely did, to um, uh, try to say, what is it that I can do? And how uh, might my actions 
uh, make the world a better place or not? You know, how might my um, uh, actions harm others? I'm going to offer actually an interesting example. And I don't know, I imagine people have followed uh, the fact that uh, Princeton University um, removed the name of Woodrow Wilson from the uh, uh, it's School for Public Affairs. And there's a very interesting little event, a little moment in the um, Rosenwald life. He was very close with, he, Rosenwald, was very close with Booker Washington. And so Booker Washington wrote to Rosenwald just after uh, Wilson had been elected. Remember, Wilson is the first Southern president since before the Civil War. And um, Booker Washington wrote to Rosenwald and said, I read that Woodrow Wilson is going to be in Chicago. Would you mind meeting with him and just telling him a little bit about the work of Tuskegee and about the school project? So Rosenwald, who was very enthusiastic, said, oh, I'll do better than that. I will um, pay your train fare to come to Chicago, and you and Wilson and I will have lunch together at my home. And Washington said, don't do that because um, Wilson will never sit down and eat lunch with me and it will embarrass him, but it's, more importantly, it's gonna embarrass me and it might harm our cause. And Rosenwald wrote back and said, fine, if that's your, I defer to you. So um, it's like, okay, he really wanted to do something good, but he thought that would be a good thing to have Wilson, Washington and himself uh, uh, um, eat together. Uh, but when somebody who really knew the situation on the ground said, not a good idea, he backed off. So I think what's inspiring there, and uh, perhaps you know, it's, it's um, a small way of answering your question, Ellie, is that we should think about what we can do, but then we should learn. You know, is this, and, and inquire and, and consult, okay, is this gonna make things worse or is it gonna be uh, a, um, a kind of just action with no sort of words without uh, any good consequences, let me find out. And so we are all, I think, walking on uncharted territory and, um, and therefore it behooves us to know we must act and to try to figure out the best way to do it. I think that question of like, no, we must act and have to figure out the best way, I think that that's really the big challenge that we're all facing right now. Myself as well. Leapfrogging on that Wilson question, this question comes to us from Jane Etter, who has been involved with the museum for a really long time, um, and actually speaks to very much the Wilson piece of this puzzle on some level. She asks, as a biography, as a biographer of a complex person, what is your take on the current movement to take down monuments mm. and rename buildings? Oh, so I, yeah. I, I did read yesterday that Margaret Sanger's name has been taken off of Planned Parenthood in New York. So, I mean, we talk about complex people and legacies, mm -hmm. but this is everywhere in this moment. And yeah. I'm excited for your take on this. Yeah, so nobody could take down any Rosenwald statues since they don't exist. Um, I think that's an incredible question and something I really spent a lot of time as a historian thinking about. And on the one hand, there are the people who um, really did bad, uh, who did evil. And I would say any Confederate for, falls into that category because they were uh, not only upholders of slavery, but they were traitors against the United States. And um, you know, what country puts up statues for um, those who led armed insurrections against the nation? But I think that, so maybe that's an easy one to deal with. I was actually taken aback about the Margaret Sanger, and there are many others, because, you know, in a way, everybody has clay feet. There is no one who we have a, a street name for, or a, uh, um, for whom there's a statue or an institution, that if we don't look, we'll see uh, that, they, that there was some uh, wrinkle, some complexity, some not, uh, particularly uh, worthy uh, things behind uh, that they did. But yet, what is the balance? I mean, Margaret Sanger, uh, and again, you didn't invite me to talk about Margaret Sanger, and I, she would make a great program because she had a lot of Jewish connections, including her husband. Uh, but uh, she uh, essentially gave birth control um, to um, not just the United States, but really to the world. And she liberated women from, um, 
uh, constant and uh, dangerous uh, uh, childbearing. She gave women control over their bodies. And yes, I mean, her, she was a eugenicist, but actually so was almost everybody else. Uh, and uh, um, so, uh, you know, it's, I'd almost say that you have to weigh and balance, um, you know, uh, the evil people did versus the, the, their, their contributions to uh, some kind of greater good. But it's, it's really not an easy task. And um, uh, I think each one I read about, I stop and think, really? And I, you know, again, I'm sure there are other questions. But there's a way in which um, that process obliterates history. And so they're going to, I happen to live like two blocks from the Margaret Sanger Street and the Ma. And well, then nobody will know who she was. And in fact, it was a really important lesson in story. And there's no reason to not have Margaret Sanger um, uh, lauded for what she did with an explanation that there were some side, you know, there were other things in her repertoire. So that that's and that's not that's a very messy answer. Uh, very and, messy um, so I don't know that there is a clean answer. That no. you know, it's going to. But um, Fran Kaplan, who is the was the longtime director of America's Black Holocaust Museum here in Milwaukee, pointed out that uh, that black people parents in the South had to pay taxes for children to go to white schools. And then they also, on top of that, were figuring out how to do the match for a Rosenwald mm -hmm. school. And sidelining with that, um, the uh, one of our other participants, I think, uh, Levin, I don't see a last name, a first name, asks, um, how are the state governments, how did the state and local governments feel about Rosenwald School. So I kind of, can I put these two ideas together and kind of throw that back to you? Yeah, really great question. So yes, uh, black parent, you know, blacks uh, were taxed by the state, uh, but before the Rosenwald Schools, they, they were taxed and they got nothing. Uh, that is, they paid state taxes, but they didn't get, you know, they didn't get even remotely um, adequate schools. Um, the schools were, some communities had no schools. It was a state of Georgia, the state of uh, Mississippi just provided no education for black children. And by the way, there's a library story to this as well, because he financed black libraries. And you, they paid state taxes to these, uh, to, you know, they paid taxes to their states and they got nothing. And where the states did provide education for black children, it was a fraction of the number of days that they that the schools were open, uh, the state allowed landowners to come in and basically close the schools so the kids would go out and work in the fields uh, during planting and harvest time. Um, the non Rosenwald schools, the non Rosenwald black schools, uh, were ill built. They had no ventilation. They had poor ventilation, no heat in the winter, no uh, open windows. I mean, they were just ramshackle. Um, the teachers often had no um, training. And again, one of the things Rosenwald does is he sets up teacher training schools. So there's going to be uh, a, a well-trained staff uh, for the schools. And in some cases, he pays the tuition of Black teachers from the South to go to the University of Chicago or to go to the University of Michigan to get advanced training. Um, but what the states provided, yes, came out of the pockets of African-American taxpayers, but they got nothing for it. And um, so, yeah, it seems really unfair to then say, but put up the teacher or provide the bricks. But again, it's a kind of balancing act, right? Uh, once the uh, local uh, Black community provides the bricks or the lumber or the housing for the teacher, um, or plumbers come in and build the, uh, um, actually literally build the school, it's their school. They have invested in it. And it's not some uh, kind of shack put up by the state of um, uh, Virginia, which um, uh, is inadequate from the beginning. So it's, it is a, um, in the best of all worlds, none of this would have been necessary. I mean, that's, you know, the, historical reality. So he insisted that um, if he was going to build the schools, the, it, the states had to do two things. For one thing, recognize the schools as 
part of the system. These were not private schools. Um, and secondly, um, he said that, um, again, using a timetable, they had to be absorbed into the public system. Okay, and again, he wasn't saying those skills have to become integrated, but they have to be absorbed. And so if um, all superintendents of schools, let's say, so there was for each state, a, a superintendent of the Rosenwald schools, okay, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, um, uh, Louisiana, again, paid for by, by Rosenwald. So there was a superintendent, but that superintendent had to go to the meetings of all states, all the superintendents of the state. And one can um, say that these were probably the first bureaucratic governmental sponsored meetings in the Jim Crow South in which there was a black person sitting at the table. Okay, and, um, and Do you know again, if they actually got to sit at the table? They got to sit at the table and they had a vote. You know, should we move to lengthening the school? You know, the, the kind of practical technicalities as well as curricular matters um, that um, uh, uh, one would imagine superintendents of education, of county superintendents of education would um, uh, discuss. And, you know, they played a role in shaping state policy. And again, one, and one of the kind of side benefits is that they create relationships with sympathetic superintendents, you know, not all Southerners were completely committed to the system. And this actually helps grow a kind of cadre of white liberals. And um, there are white um, principals and superintendents and other school officials who also got Rosenwald scholarships to go to Northern universities and be confronted with a very different philosophy of education with the hope that they would bring that um, uh, kind of more open uh, kind of attitude to Southern states. So, um, so they did get integrated and uh, with a timetable that eventually the states would take over the function, which now in some places, by the way, Rosenwald schools were burnt down. The mobs would come and uh, um, uh, burn them down and they would just rebuild them. Okay, that is the, uh, the Rosenwald Fund would come in and rebuild the schools. And um, they, um, there was a lot of hostility towards them. And many of the white landowners thought that this was creating an unruly black population because what was the worst thing that could happen is that they could become educated and see the uh, extent of um, their marginalization and deprivation uh, in, the, in the community. Um, so a couple of people have asked, you know, what happened to the schools? Were they absorbed into the public mm -hmm. school system? Uh, Fran gave a kind of description in the chat as well um, about where it meant, and, and actually goes into some detail, and I think this is a really interesting point about black teachers in Rosenwald schools versus with integration, what happens to black yeah. teachers. Yeah. Uh, and then actually an interesting additional question is, with the sunsetting of the Rosenwald funds and foundation, does that, you know, does that actually make it harder on these schools to survive because they don't have that kind of ongoing support from a national foundation? Okay, so that's, again, a great, great question. Both, um, there's several there. And um, so um, with integration, <clears throat> yes, the schools faded and they just became, uh, um, part of the um, state systems. Um, and that had been really, very, in some ways, very much his goal. And he didn't think integration was going to happen in 1920 or 1930, but it was a kind of eye on the long road. Um, there is a movement, by the way, and I'm sure you can find the website of um, an organization which is trying to identify all the remaining structures and to uh, put historic markers on them. And in the, um, uh, in the days when we are all able to travel and go to museums, uh, and you, if you go to Washington, D.C., to the um, Museum of African American History, they have a Rosenwald School in it. And um, so um, these became really part of the legacy. And uh, by the way, John Lewis had attended a, a Rosenwald School, Maya Angelou, so um, 
uh, and I mean, obviously, legion and legions, millions of other children who didn't become John Lewis and Maya Angelou, but became uh, business people and nurses and doctors and teachers and and all that. Um, so, um, so, but part of that question involved the sunsetting of the fund. And so his, you now, so I, as a historian, you know, I did begin by saying the things that Rosenwald didn't support uh, that I was annoyed me, like women's suffrage and labor unions. So I think that this is a harder call. You know, the, the idea of the um, uh, not either having its own endowment for the future or never giving to an endowment. Okay, so an institution like um, Hull House in Chicago, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, the great social settlement house of Jane Addams, she kept writing to, and she, he, they, they loved each other, and um, she kept saying, can't you do something for in his, our endowment? And he said, no, that institution has to find a way to market itself to others, and it has to, it can't be burdened now by um, the, um, any strings that I might attach to it, maybe at some point Hull House won't need to exist. You know, maybe it needs to be replaced by something else. He also, just interestingly, gave no money in his vast will to his grandchildren. He said, my children are inheriting a lot of money, although again, he gave much of it away. Let my children and grandchildren create their own foundations. Let them take on the causes that speak to them. And I can say that his daughter, um, uh, Edith, um, uh, Edith Stern, and her husband, um, Edgar Stern, um, moved to New Orleans. And the um, history of the civil rights movement is in New Orleans says the civil rights movement was hatched and financed in the home of Edith and Edgar Stern. That their home was the, hot, the center, the epicenter of all civil rights organize, of civil rights organizing in New Orleans. So they went on to do the good work that they, and, and again, they weren't um, uh, willing to do um, segregation. You know, they, he, she moves down to New Orleans in the 40s and they are already hot into the integrationist mode, into pushing for integration. So that's a good example. He doesn't give her money to continue the foundation he gives her money and with it, she enters into and uses it for a new era, um, which she, and I'd probably say rightly, um, uh, considered to be more appropriate for a later moment in time. So in our final question, and, and in this museum, we always love to get into the personal. Um, in your research, and you know, you've mentioned some of the kind of illustrious people who came out of Rosenwald schools or Rosenwald fellowships, but are there kind of memoirs about what the school day was like? Is there a lot, is there, was there any sort of work of collecting um, those individual voices and what that meant in the community? Yeah, I, mean, I think that would be a phenomenal undertaking. Nobody has done it yet. There are bits and pieces of it. Maya Angelou talks about it in her um, uh, autobiography. Um, and um, again, you know, uh, John Lewis talked about it, but um, this um, organization, which is seeking to identify the um, extant buildings, is also interested in getting um, whatever uh, um, documentation uh, might exist on, yeah, what it felt like and um, uh, the um, uh, sense of the kids of going to this, um, going to this school. Uh, now again, let's we can replicate this because he also did gave the same kind of vast infusions of money to Tuskegee, which was the school in Alabama that uh, Booker Washington ran, and to Fisk University and Howard University, and so many others. And um, he uh, was in 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 a sense uh, responsible with that money for the creation of a, um, an educated professional class of African-Americans who went on to far transcend uh, the, the limitations of uh, what Rosenwald defined as um, the, um, his entree point for making the world a better place. And uh, um, uh, so I see Fred Kaplan has said there are several groups, yes. 
And um, yeah, but as a kind of a published work, it would be a fantastic uh, uh, contribution. Um, to to understand Man, um, you have time this is this is what you should be working on <laughs> ah, okay uh and uh you know in a way uh the 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 fact that his um again memory really faded from uh, public view um after his death in the 1930s i think is in part um was in part shaped by the fact that after that period and certainly after world war ii um, the willingness to live with segregation um, is uh, just became disreputable, or not so much disreputable, but it just wasn't enough. And you know, and the push for integration and the push for equal rights, which was, you know, completely right and completely understandable, made him seem like a kind of shallow accommodator to. Um, uh, an evil system. And it's also what happened to the reputation of Booker T. Washington, okay, that uh, Washington uh, asserted, look, at, we're not going to ask for equal rights, but we demand the right to make a living, and as such, we demand the right to education. And um, while, again, after um, uh, the 1930s, that just became viewed uh, back at, within the African American community in particular, as, you know, in the phrase that was often used, kind of Uncle Tomism, accepting the legitimacy of segregation, I think, again, it makes sense, but I think it's a misreading. It's just that Roosevelt said, there's nothing I can do about the political system. The systemic racism is there, the, the institutionalized pieces, but what can I do to chip away at those? So this is what, and again, when we think about, um, you know, the subtitle of repairing the world, this is my, and it goes back almost to your first question about what is it we can do now. This is what I can't, I, this is what I can do. Okay, I can't do uh, more, but I cannot do less. Right. I cannot um, sit back in my beautiful home in Hyde Park and then my lovely country home in Ravinia and enjoy the good life, although I'm going to enjoy the good life. Uh, but that's not, that's not, I cannot just um, uh, count my millions. It's not enough, but it behooves me to use the money I have to make a difference in the world. And essentially the problem of the Negro, and again, we could do a whole session just on the problem of the Jew, uh, is what I can do in my way. And um, um, I, I can operate only within those limitations. So, so one last thing before I turn it over to Jenny Tassi, who is our partner with the, the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And she's, but we just want to know, because it's always fascinating what you're working on. What are you working on now? Yeah, so let's see, I have two minutes. So, okay, so just as a really quick uh, get to it and, um, uh, two years ago, uh, just by happenstance, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more than happenstance, I was um, asked by my dean to take over on a kind of emergency basis as the um, interim director of um, Ireland House and Irish Studies at NYU. And um, you know, I worked in immigration history, ethnic history, and I you know the people there and I felt oh, fine, I'm happy to do that. And it had the um, house, Ireland House was founded by a couple, they, the donors were a Jewish man and Irish American woman. And so it's called Glucksman Ireland House. And it happened to be the 25th anniversary of the house. And so independent of my taking over as uh, director, um, they decided they were gonna spend their 25th anniversary year, the set of programs dealing with the Irish Jewish encounter in America. So here are two people, peoples, who had they not come to the United States would essentially never have met each other. And yet it um, resulted in a very um, robust um, interaction in the labor movement, for example, uh, in American politics, uh, in theater, movies, entertainment, um, sport, all sorts of places. And um, I gave, so I, I had to give the kickoff talk for the year's programming and decided it was so rich and um, so I'm just gonna give one little tidbit because the project as I see the title of it is gonna be called How the Irish Taught the Jews to Become American. 
And so the majority of the school teachers on the Lower East Side in the decades of the big Jewish migration to America were all Irish women. These were the daughters of Irish immigrants, and they were the ones who essentially stood in front of the classroom made up of Jewish children from Lithuania and Galicia and Ukraine and taught them English, taught them into how to become American. And so the story replicates itself in a number of other venues, the, the political machine, Tammany Hall, run by the Irish, reaches out to the Jews, the labor movement where Jewish um, labor union uh, neophytes turn to their Irish uh, veterans and say, teach me how to do this. And, and American Zionists turned to Irish nationalists and said, how do you get every, how do you get so much support from your community? Um, so it's a, this kind of dabble in um, uh, inter-ethnic um, encounters in America. So that's it. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny Taffy. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Hase. This was incredible to hear about your work uh, and your deep study that you've done. And I also want to thank the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee for hosting this great get together. Again, my name is Jenny. I'm the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council, and we uh, help co-sponsor this event. And thank you everyone for coming and listening in either on Facebook now or after the fact, or if you're on Zoom. I uh, just wanted to you know, talk about how important it is to build these bridges between the Black and Jewish community, as Mr. Rosenwald did for so many years and also uplift how important it is when we're talking about Black Jewish relations, to also notice that there are Black Jews in our communities and there always have been. Um, and so I think those are really important parts of this conversation that we can continue to have. And so I'm very grateful Jewish Museum for putting this on, Hasia, for all of your research. This is incredible to hear about a man that lived out his values, and even if he wasn't perfect, did some really amazing work uh, in his time. So uh, thank you, Ellie and Cassie and everyone for putting this together. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Hasia. This was wonderful. And thank you, uh, Jenny and the Jewish Community Relations Council. Please continue to check in with them because they do a number of things in the, in the field of social justice, enabling us to take on the little piece that we can take on. We may not be able to give millions of dollars away like Julius Rosenwald, but there is something for us to do. I'd like to highlight two upcoming programs that we have. Um, and that is on August 6th at 1230. You might not be able to go into a museum, maybe you can, but you certainly probably are not traveling abroad. So we're gonna bring abroad to you by starting, we're kicking off on August 6th, our Global Museum Passport Series. This one will open with a tour of the Galicia Jewish Museum. Um, we're going to be looking at both their temporary and permanent exhibit. And, and we're gonna have an opportunity to um, hear about a famous Polish Jewish um, illustrator named Jan Marcin Sanser. The other thing is our next virtual book club is going to take place on August 12th, and we are inviting uh, Larry Ty to talk about his book, Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Joe McCarthy. Oh. Many of you know, I am, this is my period. I love the Cold War Red Scare period, and I'm really excited to have a conversation with uh, Larry about his research. He actually was able to get into archives. Uh, that have been closed. Uh, Marquette University has most of McCarthy's papers. They're closed until his uh, stepdaughter dies, his, and, or his daughter, it's his daughter. And she's a very healthy 50-year-old, and he was able to access those papers. So, as Cassie says here, donations are always helpful, but there is also the possibility of buying this book. You can go to our website. Uh, we will send it to you. We can also have it available for socially distant pickup. Um, let us know works, works, what works best. And now that we've whetted your appetite, you know, this is the opportunity to go into a deeper dive and to explore more about Julius Rosenwald. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And thanks for, Hasia, once again. My pleasure. Be well, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>